I recently had the good fortune of taking a Chinese cooking class, and it was wonderful. I learned how to use a wok and a cleaver. I would have you all over to my house to cook for you, except that I didn't actually learn any recipes. They weren't teaching that, they were just teaching the skills of using a wok and a cleaver. <laughs> Of course, that's ridiculous, and you know it's ridiculous, because no one has ever taught a teaching class that way. You can't teach the skill without some of the doctrine. You can't teach the technique without the recipes. The same thing happens in legal education, and the skills teachers have always known this. Skills teachers have always taught doctrine. Doctrinal professors often don't teach skills. We often just focus on the recipes. In fairness, we have a mission. At the end of the legal education process comes the bar exam, and the bar exam is going to require the students to know and be able to use some particular recipes, hence the debate about coverage. But I don't want to talk about the debate about coverage. I don't even want to talk about Chinese cooking. I want to talk about national security law. I got the opportunity to teach an elective in national security law, and I love this because I can talk about the procedures by which it's made. I can talk about the high-level executive missions. I can talk about the cases, all oh, the cases and the issues like domestic surveillance. And we can look at US versus US District Court, called the Keith case for the judge in the district court, in which the FBI was surveilling the White Panther Party. I just have to find the right case book that covers the right issues, and I can share this with all of my students. And then I got sad. I didn't get sad because of US versus US District Court. That's a great case. I got sad because I suddenly remembered the teachings of one of the great educational philosophers of the 20th century. And here, of course, I mean Father Guido Sarducci. <laughs> Father Sarducci, a character of comedian Don Novella, introduced what he called the five minute university. The premise being he could teach you in five minutes everything you would remember five years after you graduated. <clears throat> When I thought about inorganic chemistry and Russian history, I realized he was right. Some of you are doing that same experiment right now. And I was sad because I realized that my students weren't going to remember what I taught them about domestic surveillance. It just didn't matter. But I took heart. When I thought of the other great educational philosopher of the 20th century, Maurice Sendak, or particularly his character, Pierre. Pierre, the impish child who responds to all of his parents' offers and importunings with his three-word mantra, I don't care. <laughs> and I realized I didn't care. My students weren't going to be tested on the bar exam on national security law. A few of them would practice it, but they would learn it on the job. They would have supervisors. It didn't matter what they took out of it. Now, with this as a liberating idea, I could do something different with this class. And I realized I didn't want to teach issues like domestic surveillance at all. National security law isn't measured in issues. The unit of measurement for national security law is the crisis. One crisis followed by another crisis. So I created a series of crises for the class, like this one, which is too small to read. <laughs> but it wasn't for the students. But this was about a group of US forces that had captured some individuals who they believed had information about an impending terrorist attack in the United States, and they wanted to use these techniques, techniques of what they called enhanced interrogation to get information from the detainees. And I asked my students to answer this question, to figure out. We didn't have an issue lesson about torture. We had a crisis about these techniques. How do you do that? Well, you can't do that with a case book. So what I gave them was a common reading. We started with the Third Geneva Convention from 1949, but I told them that's not going to answer the question. That's only going to be a starting place. You're going to have to look at treaties. You're going to have to look at presidential directives. You're going to have to look at administrative materials from different federal agencies. It's too much. They can't do it. And that's why we use case books. And then I realized, in real national security law, that's why it's done in teams. <clears throat> There's the president and the National Security Council, but each of those people represents an organization made of teams with deputies and assistants who themselves have teams. And I divided up my own students into those kind of teams. So you five will be the Department of Defense this week, and you five will be the Department of State this week. And figure out how to do it. Group work is bad. 
Group work allows some people to be free riders. Group work allows some people to be overly aggressive. How did I solve that? I went back to Pierre. I don't care. <laughs> In real life, lawyers have to deal with free riders and terrible colleagues and brilliant colleagues and overachievers. Why not figure it out now in law school when the stakes are manageable? So I told them, go and run and figure it out and come to me if you need help. But I think you can solve most of these problems. But of course, all each of these groups was going to come up with was an agency perspective. We'd get a defense answer about enhanced interrogation and a state answer, but how do we share those? How do we get them to teach each other? Here's where I had a brilliant idea. You think back to that last picture, there were people who were at that meeting, not in person, but by a video teleconference. That's pretty common in government work. So I had the idea, I've got five groups. I'll go to the assistant dean and say, I need five classrooms in which to teach one class. <laughs> the response was predictable, but because our registrar, registrar is brilliant and our IT guys are brilliant, before too long we had this. I had students able to talk to each other from five separate classrooms in the same building, articulating particular agency points and teaching each other. They did it brilliantly. Sometimes they argued. This is one of those moments where two groups are talking at once. This is justice and intel. State and defense did it all the time. They fought. They really cared. It was a make-believe hypothetical. No one was actually going to get tortured. But I had unknowingly tapped into the most wonderful power of all, peer pressure. It's fine to turn in a crappy assignment to a professor, but to look bad in front of your colleagues, that's another thing. They don't want to do that. So they fought and they struggled. And afterwards, of course, you can't just stop there. We would have conventional classes afterwards, after action reviews of the kind that you heard Sean talking about. When we get together all in one classroom, I can't tell you how pleased the assistant dean was by that, and we would talk about the things they had learned, how to be a better lawyer, what worked well, what was effective, what was not. And we talked at that time, too, about the particular cases and the laws, and especially if they had missed something. We talked about some of the heroes of the law, like Judge Keith and what he did a long time ago that still has repercussions for us today. But you might not get to teach national security law, and I'm sorry for you for that. But if you get to teach any elective, you can do this. Electives, by definition, not being bar testable, you can adopt the Pierre motto. You cannot care. You can focus instead on teaching them the business of lawyering. And base it on what you did. If you have government service, great. If you had 10 years in a big firm or six months in a public defender's office or a year clerking for a judge like Judge Keith, you can take your experiences and make them into a class. At the end of the day, the students may not remember the recipes you gave them, but five months or five years from now, they'll know how to use a wand. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs>